Welcome to csstudents.com, a learning portal for company secretary students. In part 1 of the presentation, we discussed the definition of related parties. The main objective of providing that definition is to regulate the related party transactions. For simple understanding of viewers, any transaction which the company proposes to enter into with any of its related parties is a related party transaction. This is part 2 of the presentation. In this part, we would discuss the related party transactions and provisions regulating them. Let's first understand the objective of regulating the related party transaction. The main objective is to curb the conflict of interest. Let's see in this example. X Limited is a company with three directors, Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mr. C. X Limited is a listed company, so it has public shareholding also. Directors run the business of X Limited. As we know that, directors are supposed to have fiduciary responsibility towards the shareholders. But there is a likely chance that the directors approve some transaction on behalf of the company where they themselves are interested or getting a benefit. For example, one of the director, Mr. A, is the owner of a warehouse building. And now, X Limited proposes to take that warehouse building on lease to store its finished good stock. In this scenario, X Limited is entering into a transaction with one of its directors. So, it becomes a related party transaction. Then the question comes in our mind. Whether X Limited is prohibited to do the related party transactions. Whether the New Companies Act prohibits the related party transactions per se. The answer is no. Under the new Act, there is no general prohibition on the related party transactions. The company and its related parties are free to do the transactions with each other but subject to certain legal compliances. Those compliances have been provided in Section 188 and in the rules. As we know that, the directors are the decision makers for the business and operations of a company. There is a likely chance that directors may misuse their position for their own benefits. Under the Companies Act, there is no issue as long as such benefits are reasonable and against an arm's length consideration. The Act also permits the transactions which are not on arm's length basis with certain approvals and disclosures. So, in our example, if the market trend for the similar warehouse is rupees 1 lakh per month and X Limited also proposes to pay rupees 1 lakh per month to Mr. A. There is no undue benefit to Mr. A. But, if X Limited pays monthly rent of rupees 2 lakhs, then it's an unreasonable case, and, the director is benefiting, at the cost of other shareholders. So we regulate the transaction with certain approvals and disclosures. Section 188 of the Companies Act, 2013, regulates the related party transactions. But, before we discuss the section, please note that, the Act only regulates certain related party transactions. The list of those transactions, have been given the section 188. Means, if some transaction is not mentioned in the list of section 188, then, that related party transaction, shall not be regulated by this section. Now let's see what section 188 says subsection 1 only with the consent of the board of directors by a resolution at a meeting of the board and subject to such conditions as may be prescribed company can enter any of the following contracts or arrangement with a related party those related party contracts and arrangements are sale purchase or supply of any goods or materials, selling or otherwise disposing of, or buying, property of any kind, leasing of property of any kind, availing or rendering of any services, 
appointment of any agent for purchase or sale of goods, materials, services or property. Such related parties appointment to any office or place of profit in the company or its subsidiary company or associate company and underwriting the subscription of any securities or derivatives thereof of the company. So, as discussed earlier, Section 188 does not prohibit the related party transactions. It only puts certain requirements. Those requirements are, the related party transaction should be consented by the board through a resolution passed in the board meeting and subject to certain prescribed conditions. Now let's see how the consent of board taken in the meeting would help to avoid conflict of interest. If the proposed related party transaction is being discussed in the board meeting, the several board members would apply a collective judgment to the matter and would reach to a rational decision. Next, the board members, having no conflict in the transaction, may ask questions and clarification. Next, the board may assess the degree of conflict before approving the transaction. Next, if there are independent directors on the board, they can seek clarifications over unfair conditions in the proposed contract. And, if matter has been decided by the board, non-interested directors also carry the responsibility of the decision. Therefore, they shall apply the fair judgment to the transaction in the interest of the company. For certain class of companies, as well as, for certain class of transactions, the Act also makes mandatory to take the approval through special resolution for related party transactions. For special resolution, the company will have to approach to its shareholders. When shareholders are approving something, the details of that proposed transaction become wide in public. This would help to avoid any unfair condition getting approved. However, please note that the requirement of shareholders' approval is applicable only on certain class of companies or in case of certain class of transactions. Now, let's analyze the related party transactions which are covered under Section 188, one by one. The first is Sale, purchase or supply of any goods or materials. So, if X Limited is proposing a transaction with related party, where X Limited is either selling the goods or material to the related party, or X Limited is buying the goods or material from related party, or X Limited is supplying the goods or material to related party, or that related party is supplying the goods or material to X Limited. For any of these contracts, X Limited would need to go to its board for approval in the meeting. And, if X Limited or that transaction is covered under the prescribed class, it also has to take the approval through special resolution. The second is selling or otherwise disposing of or buying property of any kind. This condition pertains to the buy sale transactions relating to the properties. The term property should include both movable and immovable properties. So, if X Limited is either selling or otherwise disposing of the property to any related party or buying a property from the related party, the transaction needs to comply with the consent of the board and if required so, by the special resolution. The term otherwise disposing of should also include the mortgage transactions. The third point is, leasing of property of any kind. So, as discussed earlier, leasing of properties are also covered. In our example, either X Limited is proposing to give the lease of any of its property to any related party. Or, related party is offering the lease to X Limited. Both the transactions need to comply with the consent of the board, and if required so, by the special resolution. The fourth is availing 
or rendering of any services. This point talks about the service-related transactions. Either the company is providing services to the related party or related party is providing the services. Both the transactions need to go to comply with the consent of the board and if required so, by the special resolution. For example, if X Limited runs a call center and one of its related party provides cleaning and maintenance services. It needs to comply the provisions of section 188. Fifth, appointment of any agent for purchase or sale of goods, materials, services or property. This point relates to the appointment of any agent. So, if company is appointing its related party as its agent, or any related party is appointing the company as its agent. Both the set of transactions could be done only with the compliance of section 188. The sixth point, such related party's appointment to any office or place of profit in the company, its subsidiary company or associate company. The term office or place of profit were also part of the Old Companies Act. Earlier, Section 314 of the Companies Act, 1956, used to govern the office or place of profit transactions. Office means a post or a position in the company. Place of profit is different from office, such as a consultant to a company, where the person is not in employment of the company but still get some kind of remuneration. Under the new act, the term has been clubbed with the related party transactions. Let's look at the concept first, with an example. So, Mr. B is a director of X Limited. X Limited appoints Mr. B's son as chief marketing officer. It's a case of office held by a related party and covered under section 188. Second term is place of profit. This is different from the term office. In this case, the related party does not hold any official position, but still gets remuneration or some kind of benefits from the company. Like, if X Limited appoints one of the relative of Mr. B as consultant, and such relative gets fees from the company, it's a case of place of profit. The legal definition of the office or place of profit has been given in the explanation to section 188. The explanation says, the expression office or place of profit means any office or place. First, where such office or place is held by a director, if the director holding it receives from the company anything by way of remuneration over and above the remuneration to which he is entitled as director, by way of salary, fee, commission, perquisites, any rent-free accommodation, or otherwise. Second, where such office or place is held by an individual, other than a director, or by any firm, private company or other body corporate, if the individual, firm, private company or body corporate, holding it, receives from the company, anything by way of remuneration, salary, fee, commission, perquisites, any rent-free accommodation, or otherwise. If you notice the difference between first and second point. In the first point, the arrangement becomes office or place of profit if the director gets anything more than what he is entitled for in his position as director. Means, as long as he is getting what he is entitled as director, there is no office or place of profit under section 188. The moment he gets a single rupee extra, it becomes a case of office or place of profit and covered under the provisions of section 188. The second point pertains to the related parties other than directors. Therefore, there is no minimum permissible entitlement. Even if the related party gets single rupee from the company, it's a case of office or place of profit. The office or place of profit are very openly defined in the Act. If truly applied, 
it may cover many transactions which the company generally enters with related parties. It's the responsibility of the company secretary to ensure that any such transactions take place only after obtaining the requisite consent under Section 188. The seventh point is underwriting the subscription of any securities or thereof of the company. Underwriting contracts become important when the company is proposing to issue securities. So, if there is a proposed contract for underwriting with any related party, it has to go through the consent of board, or if required so, through the general meeting. Mandatory Disclosure to Board Members for taking an informed decision, the board should be given the enough background about the proposed related party transaction. This aspect is covered under the rules, which talks about the detailed process for related party transactions. The MCA has prescribed the company's meetings of board and its powers rules 2014. Rule 15 of these rules provides the process. As per Rule 15, if in any board meeting, any related party transaction is proposed for discussion and approval, the agenda of the board meeting shall mandatorily disclose the name of the related party and nature of relationship, the nature, duration of the contract, and particulars of the contract or arrangement, the material terms of the contract or arrangement, including the value, if any, any advance paid or received for the contract or arrangement, if any. The manner of determining the pricing and other commercial terms, both included as part of the contract and the terms which are not considered as part of the contract. Whether all factors relevant to the contract have been considered. If not, the details of factors not considered with the rationale for not considering those factors, and any other information, relevant or important for the board, to take a decision on the proposed transaction. So, with these information, the board shall be fully equipped to take the decision. Also, this requirement, reduces the chance of hiding, vital information from the board of directors. So next time, when you are preparing an agenda of the board meeting, where related party transaction is one of the item, please ensure to make disclosures, as per the rules. The sub-rule 2 of Rule 15 goes one step further. The sub-rule 2 puts an obligation on the director, who is interested in the related party transaction, to abstain from the meeting, where such transaction is discussed. So, the presence of interested director is not allowed in the boardroom when the related party transaction is discussed. Company secretaries need to be vigilant enough to prompt the interested director to leave the boardroom immediately before the related party transaction comes for discussion as agenda item. Now we discuss the special resolution requirements. As discussed, the related party transaction needs to go through the board approval process. For curbing the conflict of interest, the board can definitely provide an independent perspective. Further, non-attendance of the interested director would reduce the undue influence. But still, board decision is a closed-door affair. Also, the fact is, in case of family-run companies, the board may be more inclined towards the family management, rather than, looking at the greater good of the company. To tackle such scenarios, the law provides for shareholders' approval, for related party transactions. But, this requirement of special resolution, is applicable, only in case of certain class of companies, or in case of, certain class of transactions. The proviso to subsection 1 of section 188 says provided that no contract or arrangement in case of a company having a paid up share capital of not less than such amount or transactions exceeding such sums as may be prescribed shall be entered into 
except with the prior approval of the company, by a special resolution. So, applicability of mandatory shareholders' special resolution depends on two factors. The first is a paid-up share capital is of not less than the prescribed amount. The prescribed amount of paid-up capital is rupees 10 crore or more. So, in case of the companies having paid-up share capital of rupees 10 crore or more, all the related party transactions shall be subject to the approval by a special resolution. Next time, if some company is asking your advice for doing any related party transaction, please check the paid up capital first and then advise accordingly. The second is the value of the related party transaction is exceeding the prescribed sum. The Rule 15, Sub Rule 3 provides certain transaction wise threshold limits. If the proposed transaction is breaching the threshold limit, the special resolution shall be required. Practically, these threshold limits are applicable only on the companies having paid up share capital of less than 10 crore. So next time, if you are dealing with any related party transaction, please compare the size of that transaction with the limit mentioned under Rule 13. If the proposed transaction is overcrossing the limit, please take approval via special resolution also certain compliances relating to the special resolution. In case of wholly owned subsidiary, the special resolution passed by the holding company shall be sufficient for the purpose of entering into the transactions between wholly owned subsidiary and holding company. Please note that this relaxation is given only for the transactions between holding and wholly owned subsidiary. As shareholders are going to pass the special resolution, certain disclosures to be made to them as part of explanatory statement enclosed with the notice sent for special resolution. Those are Name of the related party Name of the director or key managerial personnel who is related Nature of relationship Nature, material terms, monetary value and particulars of the contract or arrangement any other information relevant or important for the members to take a decision on the proposed resolution. As discussed, for certain companies, or for certain transactions, special resolution is required to enter into the related party transaction. The Act provides an interesting provision in this regard. Under the new Act, the interested member is not allowed to vote on the special resolution, if such member is a related party for that contract. This is a conceptual extension from the basic provision under previous company law. Under the Companies Act 1956, interested directors were not allowed to vote. But there was no such restriction on the interested shareholders. However, under the new Act, the interested shareholder also loses the right to vote on the special resolution for related party transaction approval. Now, let's see the exemption part. Section 188 attempts to provide exemption for genuine related party transactions. Basically, this exemption would be from the requirement of board resolution and from special resolution if applicable. The proviso to subsection 1 of section 188 provides that exemption. The proviso says, provided also that nothing in this subsection shall apply to any transactions entered into by the company in its ordinary course of business other than transactions which are not on an arm's length basis. Meaning, the provisions of section 188 are not applicable on the related party transaction if such transaction qualifies on two aspects. The first is the transaction is in the ordinary course of business of the company. So, if any transaction relates to the company's main business activity, there is an exemption from the requirement of subsection 1 of section 188. The second is a negative condition. 
It says that, other than transactions which are not on an arm's length basis, means, to get the exemption, apart from being part of the ordinary course of business, the transaction should also be on arm's length basis. The expression arm's length means, the transaction is taking place on the same terms and conditions, as happens between two unrelated parties, without any conflict of interest. In this second part of the presentation, we try to understand the broad provisions to regulate the related party transactions. Viewers are welcome to post their comments. Some clarifications have already been issued by MCA on related parties. Viewers are advised to go through them. As per the news reports, MCA is also planning to modify some of these provisions. So, it's important to keep a watch over the amendments, if comes up. Thank you for watching. For more presentations, please subscribe to this channel.